I, I, I want us. I, I just want to begin. I just saying, saying what a, a, a deep honor that they're that getting that getting the 2015 Hugh Thorne of Award has has been, and uh, also also to thank you all for coming today. I hope to tell you a little bit about um, you know about a, a, a project that that we that we worked on more or less continuously throughout um, my career. A benefit of an academic career is that one 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 can follow our own research research interests pretty much freely. Of course, as long as it's important enough that we can can, can convince some funding agencies to to fund it. So I want to I want to share today a, a, a little bit about 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 my interest in, in phosphate chemistry and and how in the the spirit of, of Bill Bill Baggins, I've come back within the last couple of years back up back up again to uh, to, uh, to an area of the science that I actually actually started on back as a postdoc. So <laughs> that's not me, but that's someone <laughs> a few centuries before who discovered phosphorus. So this is a painting that depicts Henning Henning Graham's discovery of, of, of phosphorus. He isolated phosphorus from human urine. It took a lot of it. It took about 300 gallons to get one gram of, 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 of phosphorus. Um, it is said he enlisted the aid of, of a lot of beer drinkers. <laughs> so in light of the origin of the, this discovery, it, it is certainly, certainly fitting that the chemical symbol for phosphorus is the letter P. <laughs> Phosphorus, phosphorus is important throughout biology. Um, one of the most um, um, right in, in, in front of us is, is the, the fact that, that phosphorus, not as the element phosphorus, but as phosphate fertilizes plants. Um, in chemical terms, phosphorus loves oxygen, so we almost invariably see it, see it um, in, in compounds with, with oxygen. And, and phosphate is a, is a key in, in ingredient for fertilizer. But phosphate has, has roles in biology well beyond that. And as a, a, a postdoc, this was an article um, in, in, in Science um, in 1987, um, uh, by Frank Westheimer, who was, who was one of the true godfathers of, of phosphate chemistry. And this is actually a paper that I still give to students who are interested in, uh, in coming to work for, for me. It, it explains what the, what the unique chemical, chemical characteristics are of phosphate and, and, of, and, and of phosphate derivatives that has made them, made them suitable for a host of, of key roles throughout the living kingdom. But the most, Im, Im, or at least one of the most Im, Important roles is not in this paper because I, because it was only at about that that time that uh, uh, that a new key key role for phosphate ester ester chemistry in living systems was 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 just being discovered and this was the key regulatory role that that uh, attaching and removing phosphate groups to proteins has in, in biology. Proteins, for instance, make up enzymes. They make up the receptors for hormones, just to name a, a, a few. Proteins are made of um, uh, um, uh, made of uh, amino acids, and a few of, of, of these have on them a, an oxygen and a hydrogen atom called an alcohol group. And a, a family of enzymes called protein kinases convert that alcohol group, which is which you see there on the on the left, to a phosphate ester. There's a complementary family of enzymes called protein phosphatases. They simply do the opposite. And this serves as a, a regulatory switch for a host of, of, of proteins and to turn regulators on and, and off and, and receptors as well to make them more or less sensitive to, to, you know, to the small molecule, molecule that they bind to. Most of the time this is accomplished uh, by a, a subtle conformational change. So, this was an area that was that was 
it was just being discovered at that at that time, and and this has this has since seen this has since been understand to be a regulatory mechanism. But that but actually evidently nature nature develops very early on because it's found throughout biology. Here we here we zoom in on on the, the chemical details of, of details a little bit. So the magnifying glass down there shows a phosphorylated tyrosine residue. Tyrosine is one of the 20, you know, 20 amino acids. And, and in its phosphorylated state, it looks like that. So we can either have a, a, a phosphorylated protein or, or just the free alcohol group there. So this is, this is simple chemistry. Okay? The reverse process, the one that phosphatase is catalyzed, is just a simple hydrolysis. But it turns out that this is a very difficult reaction. In the absence of a, of a catalyst or in the absence of an enzyme, it is very slow. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you, you know, by way of a, a time scale here, just, just how slow this is. So this is a, a time scale that uh, I, 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 I like to use in, in, in talks. It's one that's been shown in, in a number of papers out of the Wolf in the Lab. So this is a time scale on the on the left. What we what we have are what chemists call the rate constants. It's easier to think of these these of how fast and slow reactions go in terms of half lives. Not a chemist. So so those are the numbers on the right. So these are a number of, of reactions that all occur in the cell. Okay, throughout biology, some of them happen fast. Some of them happen very slow. So we can, we can take the fastest one on the bottom there, CO2 hydration. So that's the reaction that happens if you just bubble carbon dioxide into water. Right? So carbonated water, soda. Okay, so, 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 so the carbon dioxide reacts with, with water to make carbonic acid. This is a very fast reaction. It's got a half-life of, of only five seconds. Um, there are enzymes that catalyze this reaction and speed it up it's going much, much faster. But you can see this is, this is one you don't really need an enzyme to, to have it happen fairly readily. There's a number of, of, of other biologically important, important reactions there you can see that happen with half-lives ranging from days to, to years. And now we'll go to the opposite extreme. So the, the um, half-life for, for the reaction catalyzed by, by phosphatases has a half-life of 10 to the 12th year. So th th that means that this is the, the half-life of this reaction under, under, under completely, just completely neutral conditions, uh, at, at room temperature, just in, just in water, no acid, no base, no, no catalyst. Now to give you some sense for how slow this is, Here's the age of the Earth. <laughs> so this is a reaction that essentially does not happen in the absence of a, 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 of a, of a catalyst. So this is, this is the reaction that nature has chosen to be a, the basis for a regulatory process throughout biology. And if you think about it, this, this makes perfect sense, because you want a, a reaction that has that kind of central importance to be under strict control. You don't want things happening spontaneously. Okay. So, so um, the phosphatases, however, take that, take that half-life from where it is up at, the, up at the top, and it actually brings it off-scale down below. It, it has a half-life that's, that's sub one second. So that makes phosphatases among the most the most powerful catalysts known, certainly among the most powerful enzymes known. So, so what drew me first to these these, these enzymes as, as a postdoctoral fellow was to try to understand the mechanistic details and, and what's going on at the active sites of these enzymes through the eyes of, of a chemist. So let's let's just back up and. I'll talk about chemistry for a minute and talk about how enzymes work in general. So this is a Hobbit Hill in keeping with, with my my theme. So we have we have our we we have a state on the left where the reactants are, and we have we have to, we have to get to the products by going over that hill to the right. So this is an energy barrier. Okay, all 
in any and all chemical reactions, and they have an energy barrier to them that we have to pass through. And if that energy energy barrier is is high, we get a, a we get a, a slow reaction. So you, you can imagine phosphoryl transfer, the uncatalyzed hydrolysis of a phosphate ester, that's a mountain there. The catalysts work by providing an alternate pathway that has a lower energy barrier. Okay? So we can so we can 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 get there without without having to climb as high as a hill. So if we so we take the hills away and now just put chemistry there. Here's our here's our phosphate ester on, on the on the right. Okay, R is just a, a, a designation that chemists use for a, a, a universal placeholder. So so it can be it can be any other molecule or in the in the case where we're talking about protein protein phosphorylation that's the protein. And so the reaction is just the reaction of, of that with water to split the phosphate off of the, the R group. So a, a, a catalyst has to, has to find a way to, to, to lower the, the height of that barrier. And what we have at the top of that barrier is a molecular species that chemists call a transition state. So this is a fleeting state of, of a molecule when we're in the midst of making and breaking bonds. It's not a stable, stable molecule. It is, it, as the name implies, a transitory state. So, so a, a, a phosphoryl transfer, our molecule undergoes a, a geometry change from being tetrahedral at the beginning to being a trigonal by a pyramid up at the top before going back to its product state, and that's tetrahedral. So the way an enzyme works, the way any catalyst works, is to be able to, to stabilize that transition transition state geometry so that the energy barrier is lowered, okay? Then we don't have to climb as high the hills and to get there. So how can this happen? How can, how can nature harness a, a reaction that it, it never sees? Because obviously there, this, this is it's sort of a sort of chicken and egg problem, isn't it? There can't evolve enzymes to stable a reaction or to to facilitate a reaction that uh, you know, that never happens unless you've got an enzyme to catalyze it to begin with. So it turns out that that these geometries are are seen in nature quite a bit, particularly in, in minerals. So so for instance, the, the minerals that the that the 2014 Dewan Thorne winner studies, Jenna Evans are filled with ions that that have that have trigonal bipyramidal geometries as well as tetrahedral. So these, these things are, are found throughout throughout geology. And depending upon what the what the uh, identity of the the metal ions are that oftentimes fill those particular positions in the trigonal bi bipyramid um, uh, Crystal lattice give us different colors, and humans discovered early on that these that these could be could be used to derive pigments of um, uh, uh, many different colors that depend both upon the overall shape as well as the specific identities of the ions in there. So this gives rise to minerals that are are beautifully colored, have have different shapes um, uh, that geologists. Like gem study, as as and that are, are sources of pigments that artists artists uh, uh, just like John Neely use for pottery, for paints, and, and and so on. There has been considerable speculation that that life's beginnings on Earth might have been facilitated by minerals, and that the lattice of, of minerals could have provided. And the right geometries to stabilize trigonal bipyramidal shapes, such as the one that has to happen for a phosphoryl transfer. Um, and those of you who who watch Nova, there was actually a, a, a very a very interesting episode uh, just within the past couple of couple of months on the sub subject. Now, did this happen? Well, we don't know. 
but there are there are cases of, of for instance, clays that are that have been shown to have catalytic catalytic properties towards phosphate ester hydrolysis and other reactions. So this is certainly certainly not out of the realm of possibility. So let's get back to protein protein phosphatases now. So as a postdoc, I was in a lab that um, had developed some new some new means to characterize phosphoryl transfer reactions. And there's a there was a class of protein phosphatases called protein tyrosine phosphatases, which I'm, I'm just going to call PTPs from here on. So these specifically cleave off a phosphoryl group off of a phosphorylated tyrosine. And we and, and uh, uh, other labs characterize what the specific um, active sites of these, these enzyme, enzymes look like, what the specific um, um, Components did. They all they all have a what chemists call uh, a, a nucleophilic sulfur atom that displaces the, the the tyrosine. It's a concerted one step process. Um, we, we looked at a, a number of enzymes from the, from this family, from humans, from bacteria, from yeast. So. So I, so I was there, sort of at the the, the early the, the early days where we first characterized how these enzymes and the enzymes worked. Um, it was it was interesting. Um, um, subsequently, then, as I went on to other to other projects, began my uh, academic career career here. Um, over the years, more and more protein tyrosine phosphatases were found. Um, just in us, there are a, a, a couple of hundred right now, just in humans. Um, um, one of the human ones is the one called PTP1B, and that regulates the receptor for a, insulin. Um, a very similar enzyme is a, is a, a, a is the, the lethal agent that the Yersinia bacteria that causes causes bubonic plague secretes into its host. That one's called YAP H. It's it's alarmingly similar to PTP one B. They're both in, in an overall shape, and it does exactly the same chemistry. Um, uh, 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 there's a, a couple of other human en enzymes here that we've looked at looked at them through the years: VHR and VHZ, and then a, a Bacterial one, STP one. Uh, there's a, a number of these found throughout the, throughout biology. Like all enzymes, PTPs are are big, and the active site, the business area there, where enzymes actually do their their chemistry, is always tiny compared to the enzyme as a whole. So, so here, we, here we've zoomed in to the overall structure of the human enzyme, PTP1B. And you, can, you, you can see, like, like, like all the enzymes in this family, or enzymes in general, the active site is, is extremely small. Um, another thing that was discovered and uh, uh, appreciated over the years is more and more PTPs were, were isolated and crystallized, which allows Allows us to get allows us to get X-ray crystal structures, which gives us a molecular detailed three-dimensional three-dimensional shape of the of the of the enzyme. Is that there's a part of the the PTP that is flexible. This picture shows shows two different structures of the human enzyme PTP one B superimposed on each other. One was was crystallized having phosphate bound at the active site, the other one wasn't. And we can and they, they overlay on each other very well with the exception of that part shown in, in green up at the top. That's a, a section of, that's about 14 uh, amino acids long. It's called the WPD loop. Okay, that name's not 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 especially um, Important. What's important to know is that it seems to be able to uh, to adopt two different positions. It needs to be closed for chemistry to happen, because on that that loop 
is the the acid that you that I I, I, I didn't point out, but uh, the part of the mechanism that we saw a, a few slides ago was was that there's a proton donor that delivers a, 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 a proton to the tyrosine group as it leaves. So that helps the reaction happen. And this loop has to close to bring that acid, which is which is the one the, the, the acid shot up at the very very top there in, in red. So this was interesting. If, if you want to design an uh, efficient catalyst, why would you have a catalytically critical group not always in the place that you needed it? And so that was that was that was one of the things that led me to, to begin to, to get re-interested in, to come back again to study these enzymes. Another one was that these, these enzymes are indeed very, very similar. This picture shows the, the four enzymes in the BTP family that I showed a couple of, a couple of slides ago, plus some more. This has actually seven different PTPs superimposed on each other. So these are what we call ribbon diagrams of the, of the and the protein, so we see the helices and the, what we call the beta sheets there off on the, the right. At first glance, this, this might just look like a, a, a tangled ball of, ball of yarn, but this is actually seven, seven completely different protein tyrosine phosphatases superimposed on each other, each is in a different color. So you, you can see that, that the helices and the, the, the beta sheets you know, superimpose on each other fairly well. And there's even a, a more striking similarity between the active sites of these, these enzymes. So here again is the human PTP1B and the Yersinia bacterial enzyme called YAPH. So the active sites where the chemistry happens superimpose on each other extraordinarily well. Okay. So, so you can, you can see up on up on top. There's the closed WPD loop closed the way that it, it, that this that this has to be for chemistry to happen. Those of you who are biochemists know that the D is a, a single letter abbreviation for aspartic acid, and, and that's the one that's shown up on, on the top there um, explicitly. The red and the gray balls in, in the middle are are tungsten state ions that was that were co-crystallizing with the enzyme. So that's not a, not a, a part of the enzyme, but it's, a, it's an ion that, that resembles phosphate. So we can see there's a loop called the P loop down there that makes hydrogen bonds and bonds the, the phosphoryl group. So it's striking how virtually identical these active sites are for two enzymes that are completely different. Okay, one is, is very important to our health, the other one's injected into us by Yersinia pestis to kill us. Okay, so uh, yeah, a couple of years ago, uh, another another aspect of catalysis by these enzymes struck me, and that is the the highly variable reaction rate. So, so the reaction rate here that I, that I show is the number of catalytic cycles per second that each of these enzymes do. So remember, these things all have essentially identical active sites. So, so why, are, why do these rates vary so, so much for what are seemingly identical catalysts? The other thing that was, that was, that was interesting is that just based upon X-ray X -ray crystal structures, which, which you know, uh, you can tell if, if, if this, this enzyme, if a, a particular enzyme sometimes crystallizes with a, a loop open, or sometimes with closed, that implies that that, that, that region is flexible. If, if the crystal structure always shows it in the closed active position, it was inferred that those enzymes don't have that, that region of flexibility. It, it, seemed, it seemed odd that the ones with an acid on a, a flexible a floppy loop ought to be the fastest in the group because, because, uh, because again, if you, if you need this loop to be in the closed position to have the chemistry happen, what possible benefit would there be to have that tool flopping around, right? So, so this was, this was in, in, in intriguing as, as well, and I, I began to suspect that there was, first of all, some catalytic advantage 
to, to have it on, on, on a flexible, flexible loop. And that perhaps the, the, the significant rate difference between PTP 1B and, and YAP H might be, might, be, might be tied to the rate at which, at which that loop moved. So over, over the years, and in, in collaboration here with Sean, Sean Johnson, we've made, we've made great use of, uh, of crystal structures of our enzyme chain of mutants. But that's only a, a snapshot. And if we want to understand an enzyme in the way of understanding how a bird, um, how a bird flaps its wings, we want to understand how these enzymes flap their WPD loop. Uh, the, the drawback of, of a crystal structure is, is you only get a, a snapshot. Furthermore, it's a snapshot of, of a protein that's not dissolved in, in water uh, like it is in the cell. It's, it's, it's crystallized and it's frozen. So it's sort of like, like trying to understand how birds fly by looking at it like this. The bird watchers in the group will know that the, the that, that these must be Canada geese because they've, they've got the diagnostic field mark of a uh, maple leaf. <laughs> so we, we had to turn to a, a, another tool to supplement what, what crystallography can tell us. And, and this, this, has been a, this has been a tool that chemists have used for many years, nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, this, is, this uses quite similar Technology to MRI, which, which some, of you, some of you may have had, is, is each dot corresponds to one nitrogen atom in this Yapage protein. Basically, what we are, we are looking at is a, is a peak as if we were above a, a mountain range looking, looking down on, from, on, from on top. Okay, so, each, so each mountain is a, is a point, it, it's going to have different widths different contours, and as the radio frequency that's used in the NMR experiment varies, that will have effects on the width of, of those peaks. And by, by changing the field and, and seeing, seeing um, how, these, how these data um, are, are changed, um, one can get an indication of what regions of this protein are undergoing motion and of how fast it is. So this allows us to get back to the question directly and to confirm the, the hypothesis that led us down this road. So here we've got again PTP1B and yap H there, so we can see that the, that the catalysis rates differ and that they correlate very well with the, with the, the WPD dynamics rates are. So, so this was this was a, a very nice outcome. This this um, this wasn't the first um, example where it was shown that protein motions are a key part of, of enzymatic catalysis. Far from it. But this was the first the first instance where it was it was shown that two you know two enzymes in the same family that are, are mechanistically um, um, identical. Um, undergo uh, under the same reaction at, at, at very different rates as a result of different protein dynamics rates. So it's quite possible that this is a, a, a in fact, throughout the whole PTP family that, that gives rise to the, different, to the different catalytic rates. That's one of the directions that we want to go in. Also, this, you know, if, if you just think, think about why, why should these two enzymes evolve to have such different rates, this makes sense from a, a, a biological perspective, too. Um, because the best enzyme isn't necessarily the fastest one. PTP1B is a, is a part of a complex network of, um, in humans, whereas, whereas the, the op -H, it's only its only business is to just wreak total havoc after the enzyme gets secreted in, into us. So, so there will be there will be more of an evolutionary benefit for it to evolve to be a, a, a very very fast enzyme. Where whereas whereas since PTP1B is a 
and you know, has to function as a as a part of a complex pathway. And just going faster might actually be counterproductive. So where we're going with this project now, and, and it's been really fun to come back to these enzymes uh, again after after 25 years. We're trying to understand why these loops move at such different rates in, in enzymes. So I mentioned that there are hundreds of proteins, hydrogen phosphatases known. I, I focused on those two at the, at the top. Um, this slide shows the, uh, the, um, the single letter of, uh, um, uh, abbreviations for the um, uh, amino acids that are in the flexible loops. You can see it's, it's always about 14. I'm talking about 14 amino acids long. Some of them are the same, some of them aren't. Uh, the, the depth of the red color here indicates the, the, the degree to which they're, they are conserved. So what we want to understand is, 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 the, is the rate of loop motion controlled by the amino acids at the two ends, and, 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 and um, you know, in other words, where the hinges are, or is it the overall uh, overall sequence of the loop itself, or is it is it is, is it something in the in the in the adjoining adjoining regions? So this is this is something that we're that we're taking this project forward on. Among among other things that we're doing is to is to make what are what are called loop um, exchange chimeras, where we actually take the whole loop out of one enzyme and swap it into the other, and then ask the question, well, does it move? at the rate it did in its home enzyme or in the, in the new one. So it's, this is a, a fun class of enzymes to be able to use to probe some real fun, fundamental, fundamental properties in the control catalysis. So chemistry is indeed highly collaborative. So um, in the early days, John and Zhang Yin and I were all were all postdocs, um, and, and they were in a, a lab that was discovering some of these uh, these protein tyrosine phosphatases. So they so they brought them to Madison, Madison, where I was, and we, we, uh, we did some some good work there, and we stayed friends since. In the the more current work, we've had to employ some new techniques, so I, 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 I mentioned Sean, he's been a, a key collaborator, and the MR work has been done with um, Pat Laurie at um, Yale. So the three of us are in, just beginning the second year of a, of a four-year four year grant to pursue this, and I'm, I'm also in debt to the NIH, which I've, I've been fortunate to um, be, 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 um, enough to have fun funding from throughout my career. So, so this work doesn't happen without students. And through the years, uh, I've had a number of, 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 of students, both graduate students, most doctoral fellows. Um, um, they're listed, listed here. They have been for, the first authors on a, 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 a lot of the papers through the years, both on the, the protein tyrosine phosphatase project, plus some others that we've done in the intervening years since I was there and um, have come back again. Um, we, um, the youngest person in, in this picture, I should give a, a, a shout out to my, to my daughter's graduating this year as. Um, her own, her own college's uh, undergraduate um, um, a, a researcher of the year. So she's a, 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 a So I've, uh, I've had a number of undergraduates also through the years, and, and you, know, you know, they have also, also contributed, contributed Significantly to this work, and I also have to have to thank my life partner and, and, the, and my wife Mary Beth, who's been with me through a, a, a long career, and hopefully, hopefully, one that's going to continue. 
So I, I would, would like to thank, thank you all for coming, and I would be, I would be more than happy to answer questions. Why does the loop open at all? Sorry. Sorry what's the, say it against you. So in the mechanism of closing rate, so what's the uh, reason that the loop uh, opens? Could it be evolutionarily advantageous to stay closed? Yeah, I, that's precisely a question that got my hair. Because 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 there are a, a number of enzymes in the, in the family that at least based upon crystal structures the loop stays permanently closed. So one would one would think that they should be the most catalytically active, since this loop doesn't close o over the sub the substrate. It's, it, it doesn't have, have anything to do with, with binding and keeping substrate down. I've I've, I've got a, a suspicion. It, it, it would be hard to prove, but one one potential answer is that that as that loop swings in. It brings up a proton donor, and and if, if, if that proton donor is not just simply protonating the leaving group as it as it leaves, but what if it's actually coming in and 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 forcing a, a hydrogen bond to that ester oxygen before the phosphorus oxygen bond starts to break, it, what, what, what one would have is what a chemist would, would, would call a protonated ester bond. That would destabilize that, that bond and ought to facilitate catalysis. So that's, that's, that's one, one potential answer to that question. That's going to be that's going to be hard to prove. That would that would mean that essentially protein motion is coupled to catalysis and is actually part of the reaction coordinate rather than the loop closing and, and you know, then then having chemistry happen. The ones that are permanently closed are those also the fastest. No, the ones with the loop, loop permanently closed tend to be the slower ones. So so. That uh, exactly is the conundrum that we hope to get some some clues on. We also have been trying to get at that by trying to make a, a mutant that, for instance, on on the Yabesh enzyme would cause the loop to stay permanently closed. That would allow us allow us then to see does it still still maintain you know, that very very high rate of uh, a thousand plus. Per second, or does it drop back to the static? So far, that we 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 have been a, a, a able to freeze the loop, but it's it, but it's in a, a, a it's in a, a, a completely non-productive half-closed position. Does having the loop open or close influence access by the substrate to the catalytic side in any way? No, no, no. The, so. So the substrate comes in from, from here, and then, and then the loop kind of comes in here from the, from the side. It doesn't hinder access. Yeah, uh, Alan, you, did, you didn't say too much about your evolution of, of, uh, in your career, but I'm struck by seven years teaching high school. Did that period of time was that a critical gestation period for you? To, uh, did you ever have a vision at that time that, gee, I mean, this is okay for now, but I'd like to do something great later? How did, how did that occur for you? And I'm really how did that happen? Yeah, it's Einstein's a long story. story. Einstein's miracle year was happened when he was a patent agent. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I grew up in the, the 60s, and, you know, you know we, we wanted to make the world a, a, a better place. So, so I, as I was, was completing my bachelor's degree, I, 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 I began to, to volunteer at a, 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 a couple of high schools to teach math and, and, and stuff like that. I really, really had a, a passion for teaching. And 
you know, so 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 after graduation, I, I specifically wanted to teach not in a, a private school out, out, you know, out in the sub suburbs. I I I I, I, you know, I, I, I got a job in downtown teaching high school where the overwhelming majority of our of our students came from housing projects. So that was an eye opener in many ways. It's, it, it, it had a profound effect on me politically and a, a lot of things, things that I saw there really, really, really molded my thinking in many ways about many issues that, you know, I, I, I could go on for a, a, a long time about. So I actually went back to graduate school though thinking that I would get a, 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 teaching environment where social promotions and other, and other political issues weren't as, as frustrating. But as I mentioned, I, I, I'd never done undergraduate research. And so once, once I got in the lab, that was a real turn on too. So it was only a, 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 a natural development then that I, I stayed on for a PhD and then you know, ultimately ended up in an academic career where I One of the questions. Let me end with a quick comment. Uh, I once fancied myself a future in chemistry. I loved freshman chemistry. Did okay with organic chemistry. It's a lot more fun than general chemistry. Yeah, I got into biochemistry and was so, okay. I, can, I think I can survive this. Analytical chemistry really knocked me down. Physical chemistry dropping on my knees. I said, I'm going to leave this to a better man than me. <laughs> I have met the better man right here. Alvin Henney, the 2015 D. Wynne Thorne Award. Congratulations.